This project uh, involves a, a very fruitful collaboration between our experimental group, whoops, <laughs> uh, our experimental group at Swinburne University in Melbourne, and the a theory group headed by Christoph Saka in Krakow, Poland, and a uh, theory group, uh, Jia Wang, Brian Dalton, uh, Hui Hu uh, in Melbourne. Um, So it's just over a decade now since uh, Frank Wilczek uh, published his landmark paper on quantum time crystals. Uh, it came up with a, a very provocative state, a question, can a quantum many-body system exist that spontaneously breaks time translation symmetry uh, and undergoes periodic motion in analogy with the formation of an ordinary crystal in space? Uh, to give what he called uh, a quantum time crystal. Uh, this was followed by uh, a related paper, but uh, more experimentally realizable proposal by Christoph Sucker, uh, who showed that a periodically driven many body system can spontaneously break time translation symmetry and self-reorganize its motion so that it propagates with a period much longer than the drive, the period, say, S times longer than the period of the drive, capital T, um, which was, has been called a discrete time crystal. And uh, in particular, he, he proposed an experimental way of, doing, of uh, producing such a time crystal um, where you have say a Bose-Einstein condensate here bouncing on an oscillating mirror. So the mirror is the drive with a period of capital T. And uh, it's bouncing resonantly on the oscillating mirror so that the bounce time is equal to an integer, integer multiple of the, of the drive time, of the drive period. So, uh, one of the interesting things is such a system can exhibit a dramatic breaking of time translation symmetry. Uh, we, we can get big time crystals up to uh, maybe about 100, up to about 100 temporal lattice sites. Uh, and it's essentially because of the gravitational potential that the atom is moving in. Uh, and this way provides a lot of vers versatility uh, for uh, performing condensed matter physics in the time dimension because we now have quite a large crystal in the time domain. Uh, it's been, there are other proposals came later in particular involving spin systems. So with S, say S equals two, spin up, spin down, it could be increased a little bit, but not too much. Uh, and uh, by these authors. And then since then, there's been a number of experimental papers I haven't mentioned them all here, but uh, uh, these are the ones I've listed. Uh, so we'll just start off with a simple system first, where we have uh, uh, a single particle case. In other words, we have non-interacting atoms bouncing on an oscillating mirror, and we have transverse confinement here. Uh, the single particle Hamiltonian for a closed system, we're now talking about in the oscillating frame and we'll use gravitational units for convenience here, uh, takes this form, a kinetic energy term, here's the gravitational potential, and here's the mirrored, the, uh, the mirrored uh, drive term. And uh, when you look for solutions here, you, uh, because of the periodic driving, you find that you have resonance islands in phase space. In phase space here, we have action versus angle uh, coordinates. And this is done for the case, for example, of S equals 40, where the bounce period is 40 times longer than the driving period. Uh, we've only shown one quarter here out to two pi, so we have 40 resonance islands. And for this amplitude of lambda 0.2, we get nice, nicely stable islands. But when the amplitude becomes much larger, we start getting chaotic motion, and chaotic C comes in here. 
So um, we now consider the mini body case um, where we have n interacting bosonic atoms bouncing on an oscillating mirror. Uh, we consider, first of all, that the mean field gross pedievsky equation, this can be expanded as a sum of localized Blania states, like in solid state physics. And um, the mini body Hamiltonian then resembles uh, Bose Hubbard like Hamiltonian, where you have uh, a tunneling term here given by this expression. And uh, you have uh, an interaction term, u, uh, in this part here. So uh, with the calculations, first consider the case of weak interaction approximately equal to zero. The interaction is characterized by g times n, the number of atoms. The atoms prepared in initial wave packet, uh, they can because of the weak interaction, they can tunnel to neighboring wave packets, and this leads to an unstable decaying system here. Due to tunneling, you can get tunneling from one wave packet to a, a neighboring wave packet, and you can get it coming back again, and so on. Then when we increase the interaction, if it's sufficiently strong uh, compared with the critical interaction, uh, this localizes the wave packets and suppresses, uh, suppresses the tunneling to neighboring, neighboring wave packets. And it can create a, a superposition of S localized wave packets, which is like a Schrodinger cat state, which then collapses into uh, one of these S wave packets. So this gives us a spontaneous breaking of time translation symmetry. And we get these stable uh, discrete time crystal evolving here with uh, uh, a period S of T uh, for extremely long times in this calculation out to 500, uh, 5,000 driving cycles. Um, so uh, it's important to consider uh, the mean field assumption. Um, and these are some deep, very detailed calculations carried out by Jia Wang and Brian Dalton, they're both in the audience, so they feature here in this photo. Um, and these calculations can allow for quantum depletion, uh, which can avoid, this avoids restrictions of just single mode theories, mean field theories, and allows for quantum fluctuations, which may destroy the time crystal. These calculations were done for the case of, simple case of S equals two. And, uh, these very interesting results. Um, this shows the, the maximum depletion out to 2,000 driving cycles, which was about as far as it could go, versus the interaction strength. And we see that there's virtually no, uh, when you're a fair way away from the critical interaction here, uh, there's virtually no depletion uh, that can be detected. And, uh, but at the critical interaction strength, quantum fluctuations uh, come in as not un totally unexpected, uh, but this doesn't uh, show up, of course, in the mean field uh, calculations. So just a little bit about the experiment which we're working on at Swinburne. Uh, the atomic system that we've chosen is uh, potassium-39. Uh, it's uh, chosen, first of all, it's a, a bosonic atom. It has uh, the wavelengths for the D1 and the D2 transitions are convenient wavelength range where we get diode lasers. Um, but most importantly, is it has a beautiful uh, broad feshback resonance at 402 Gauss here, which enables us to vary very precisely the atomic interaction. And it works out at about 0.64 uh, radius per gauss. So it enables us to really tune through this region near zero interaction, which we need. So this is an experiment. Um, so the, we have a two-dimensional magneto-optical trap which produces a, a, a slow beam of uh, atoms, potassium-39 here, which uh, 
which tra is transferred into the three-dimensional magneto-optical trap, which is where we do the experiment. I should say that here we have uh, something like 28 intersecting laser beams in a uh, space of about a millimetre. Uh, we have four different wavelengths. We have 767 nanometres, which is uh, for the 3D MOT. Uh, this is the D2 line of potassium. And we have uh, the D1 line, which is used for grey molasses. Uh, I'll say a little bit about that in a moment. And for optical dipole trap, we use a 1064 nanometer laser. And for the magnetic, for the uh, mirror to bounce the atoms from, we'll use a repulsive light sheet mirror, 532. So just going back, um, so potassium, one of the difficulties in potassium is the nuclear mag magnetic moment is very small and the hyperfine splitting in the excited state is small. So you can't really use uh, sub classical subdoppler cooling techniques uh, because it's difficult to uh, tune the laser to the red side uh, to give you subdoppler cooling because of the, these various uh, small splittings here compared with uh, the natural line width. So we have to use uh, uh, a more difficult technique called grey molasses, uh, which effectively you have uh, sort of lambda transitions uh, giving you your um, Sisyphus cooling. Uh, so this presents challenges. It's so much harder system than uh, potassium 39, uh, than uh, rubidium 87, for example. So, um, the sort of signature we're looking for. Um, this is the case of S equals 40. Um, in the case where the interaction is very small, very close to zero, um, this shows the probability density versus distance. This is this, you drop the atoms at this point, they bounce off the mirror here, interfere, and here we have interference. Um, this, these are snapshots taken over after 50, five bounces, um, and then when we, when we add the interaction, the positive interaction, we now get a stable time crystal here where you have no tunneling. Here we have tunneling between lattice sites, temporal lattice sites. So uh, this is the sort of signature we're looking for. Applications, um, first of all, uh, we're aiming to do condensed matter physics in the time dimension. Uh, periodically driven single particle can behave in the time domain just like an electron moving in a space crystal or very similar to. Um, and you can have many body condensed matter phenomena also observed in the time dimension just by, via the Bose Hubbard Hamiltonian. Um, we have two knobs that we can play with. Uh, we can dial up almost any driving function for our mirror here. Uh, so we can produce sort of arbitrary time lattice potentials just by suitable choice of Fourier uh, components. And we can, we can modulate the contact interaction here uh, versus time. And this way we can average out the short range contact interaction so that we're left with uh, long range interactions in the Bose Hubbard uh, model. These, these become, become important. And this enables us to uh, produce exotic sort of interactions here uh, in a time lattice, including interactions which aren't found in nature. Here, this just shows the interaction versus lattice sites for the case of S equals 20 here. But we, have both positive and negative interactions, for example. So we have a lot of flexibility of what can be done. Uh, we can also, in principle, produce a two-dimensional time lattices by having two mirrors, two oscillating mirrors, with the atoms bouncing backwards and forwards between them here. Or in principle, you might be able to have three mirrors to give you three-dimensional time lattices. Uh, a case of, of interest is to have when the two oscillating mirrors are at 45 degrees now to give us a wedge. So we have one mirror uh, vertical here 
in the direction of gravity, another one at 45 degrees. And if the atoms bounce backwards and forwards here, we have a change, if, when it hits the vertical mirror, we have a, a change of momentum uh, from Px to Py, or if it hits the 45 degree mirror, then you have a change of momentum, uh, just the direction of Px goes to minus Px and Py remains unchanged. And what this does in effect is you have a flip here, which uh, gives you a sort of temporal Mobius strip. And uh, this is, enables you to produce lattices, two-dimensional lattices of various symmetries. Here, for example, with these parameters, uh, you can produce a honeycomb lattice here, or in this case, you can produce a, a Lieb square lattice. And um, the Mobius strip geometry enables us to host a variety of 2D lattices. Uh, the Lieb lattice in particular exhibits exotic flat band physics. Do I have another minute? Thank you. Okay, uh, so some of the, the condensed, condensed matter physics that's been worked out in the theory uh, so far, is Anderson localization, this is in the, uh, due to temporal disorder now rather than spatial disorder, where you have exponentially localized states where versus time it just freezes out, uh, the, uh, the atoms just remain frozen and localized. Or you can have, um, you can have many body localization where you have uh, interactions. Um, mod insulator phases in the time domain where the on-site interaction is much larger than the tunneling rate. You can have topological insulators here with symmetry protected edge states. And you have quasi time crystals where you have long range order um, without periodicity such as in a Fibonacci sequence. And then uh, potential practical applications. Um, this is looking into the future. Uh, if we now use time space lattices, in other words, we have instead of having bouncing atoms bouncing from a, an oscillating mirror, we have uh, a periodically driven optical lattice where the atoms uh, are moving backwards and forwards in a collective oscillation and we drive the lattice essentially when we shake it. And this is suitable for practical applications. And in particular, we've been working on um, what we've coined the term timetronics, where you have temporal analogues of electronics, uh, such as worked out ways of producing temporal p-type, n-type semiconductors, uh, temporal diodes, transistors, field effect transistors, storage devices, all in the time domain. They have certain potential advantages. And most recently, what we're working on is a, a universal temporal circuit lattice, which gives us essentially arbitrary uh, temporal quantum devices, such as temporal quantum gates, and we're hoping a universal quantum process, processor. So to summarise, uh, I think we're hard up for time, so I'll just leave this up. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, for the space-time lattice, it's me. <laughs> uh, for the space-time lattice idea, would the interactions in space also need to be periodic? Uh, temporally periodic or spatially? Temporally. temporally periodic. They don't need to be, but you can you can do you can use this as an extra uh, degree of freedom. Yes. Thank you.